What I wanted to do briefly was talk about, uh, and the title really gives it away, about the function of price in freight infrastructure. In the last few years, particularly in the last five years, we've seen um, growing agricultural awareness of the fr of freight infrastructure. AGIC did some good work recently on the um, grain freight being about 30% of the input costs of grain production. Very large amount of, on your balance sheet that you uh, don't have a lot of control over. Um, where, where it's trending is that if you're looking at agriculture infrastructure, unlike mining infrastructure and freight infrastructure, generally speaking, a lot of places around the country, if you're a miner, you can largely, private sector can get in and build its own infrastructure or, or upgrade its own infrastructure, rail, port, some haul roads. If you're dealing with agriculture, you're almost certainly dealing with publicly owned infrastructure. I wanted to talk in that context because that's important. Um, the government now and, and some of the industry groups are starting to do work around supply chains and uh, looking at you know what, how things work in freight, what, what are the costs. I'd argue from a market perspective that most of the growers know the cost because it's in the FOB price. What we're interested in and what are, from a market perspective growers are interested in and investors in infrastructure is lowering that price. So projects and, and investments that actually lower the price to the grower make you more competitive overseas. We can have free trade agreements, which by the way, the people who are doing them with us will do with, uh, with their other suppliers as well, a bit of a zero sum game. Uh, if we don't maintain that freight productivity and competitive advantage in price, um, you'll find people lapping you. Um, I'm optimistic in saying there are major gains available. We'll talk about a couple of them. But the, I guess the message from today, if there's anything, is that we have to understand that we're in a largely public sector dominated piece of infrastructure with roads, rail to some extent, ports to a lesser extent, although ports really for their efficiency rely on the upstream road and rail solutions. Um, so in a situation in Australia where on average your ports are doing about 3.5% return on equity, world ports are probably doing around 9.5%. We've got to get that upstream uh, right if we're going to add value to those investments. So look, very quickly, we'll just go for one example, um, which is probably the most significant single piece of infrastructure for, certainly for grain freight, um, for freight generally on the east coast of Australia, which is a mainline heavy rail solution up and down the east coast. Currently on the east coast of Australia, about 80% uh, market share of freight is uh, on trucks. Um, so this is some work Grain Corp did last year. Uh, a little bit uh, dense as a graph, but really what it's saying is the orange line is uh, what it costs to move grain on rail in New South Wales at the moment through a lot of very old branch lines down to a lot of different little ports, uh, clunkety clunkety. And the, the bottom line, uh, the grey line, is, is representative of what the Canadia's heavy, heavy gauge mainline rail uh, produces as a, as a price for their growers to move. So about $20 difference. The, the remarkable thing about that is that um, most of the Canadian grain grows out in the prairies, which are on average probably around 1,000 kilometres longer distance away from their ports than most of the grain that gets grown in Australia. So they're much further away, but they're much more connected in a price sense for what they're trying to do. Um, now, a little bit of simple numbers around that. Rather than $20 a tonne, I'm using 16 here to conjure with because we really can't get to the, to the axle weights and the heavy rail gauge of, uh, of Canada very easily. We could get probably see, probably I'd argue, a $16 per tonne increase with mainline East Coast Rail. If you take 13 million tonnes, which is how much, how much went out of the ports between South Australia and Brisbane a year or two back, that's looking about a saving of about $208 million a year to the grower. If you invested that with the miracle of compound interest, you'd be somewhere up near $3 billion over 10 years. So if you just bear that in mind, You'd be aware at the moment that the current government, uh, which uh, slightly more sane than the previous government, which was looking at um, passenger rail between uh, up and down the east coast, um, has looked at reviving this idea of an inland rail linking Brisbane with the, uh, the northern reaches of the New South Wales standard gauge rail network. The problem you've got is this. Um, at the moment, the government's allocation to that inland rail uh, build it's about 75 million a year for the next few years of the budget. That's for planning and preparatory works. There is no identified white knight financier of that rail build. It's very difficult to get any clear estimate from the government on when that's going to be built. Now, if it's going to take 10 years or more to build, um, 
you're looking just for the growers. And bear in mind, the growers on a mainline class one rail network are a very small fish. But nevertheless, you're looking as a growing community around nearly $3 billion opportunity cost. Um, probably a uh, fair bit more than that if you add in the reduced maintenance on roads um, and probably the efficiencies of scale you'll get at uh, some of the ports. So what that's drawing you to in price is, is it's a financing issue, time value of, of money, and in a public asset, who's allowed to invest? These are really the key things hopefully we can get across to the farming sector that uh, it's not always the government that's going to solve these solutions and we need to work around how we, how we bring productive market investment into the, uh, into the equation. To give you an alternative very quickly, Kenya as of last year concluded um, a deal to um, build a similar length of, um, of rail um, uh, between its port See uh, blue, blue water port at Port Mombasa, back to Nairobi, the capital, nearly 500 k's. Um, that's part of a very ambitious network which links most of East Africa. Um, slightly higher axle weights than we would build it here. That in Australia, the main rail network is, owned, is a government-owned corporation, Australian Rail Track Corporation, uh, double stacked. So a, a good solid network. Um, that's a public-private partnership. It's 90% Chinese finance. Uh, began work in November last year. The contract was signed. They're already there on the ground. They've put their own uh, work teams. Um, they're going to conclude it by 2017. And there's penalties that apply in the contract if they don't. Um, the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde's shop, analysed it at putting 1.5% on Kenyan GDP year on year. Now, you won't get that sort of growth out of an Australian most coast mainline because Kenya's working off a very low base of freight productivity. Well, what that's telling you is that um, there are different approaches to doing serious freight infrastructure, commercial freight infrastructure, if you're prepared to look at productive market models. That's just a picture of the ultimate East Africa rail network. Um, that is the creation of China. China um, has, you may have heard of the Silk Road uh, policy. The Silk Road policy is essentially helping people that are supplier nations to China's requirements, um, helping them to finance the kind of freight and industry and infrastructure solutions that will result in cheaper products and more reliable food security and other security to China. So um, they're into uh, East Africa doing that so that they can uh, ensure low cost and stable uh, product supply from them into the future. The question then becomes, well, okay, it's, a, it's largely public owned and government owned and controlled. Who really can plan and spend on infrastructure now? Um, and what are we spending on? It's a very simple graph, my take on it. If you look at roads across the top, owned by government, access controlled by government. If I want to put a B-double on something instead of a semi-trailer, I have to go and talk to the roads agency. They might say no, they don't have any extra money um, to upgrade the road. Financed by government, very little except for a few toll roads. Uh, National Rail, the, the, the rail track we're talking about on the east coast, also the one that runs over to Kalgoorlie and the west. Government owned, it's actually, access is actually via the Rail Track Corporation. If you have a train, you can go on it if you're prepared to pay. Uh, but financed by government. So hence this issue of when are we going to get our East Coast uh, mainline railway? Well, when the taxpayer can afford it, not in the budget at the moment. Uh, ports are a mix, as you know. Some ports have been privatised. Unless you get that upstream scale on your road and rail operations, you're going to find more and more ports popping up like mushrooms because... Everyone will try and compete with each other. Not very effective for scale and mix and efficiencies. Um, and the sea channels are another issue, and we're seeing it up at Gladstone and a few other places. We don't maintain our sea channels. We don't maintain competitive shipping channels for uh, international freight. Tassie, about six, seven years ago, dealt itself out of direct international trade um, from shipping. Um, lots of hullabaloo about that, and now a subsidised carrier coming in with a small vessel uh, regularly to try and pick up some trade from Tassie. Uh, as part of the review I did uh, two or three years ago, we simply asked the companies that were servicing that route and they said, well, it's as simple as this. We have vessels that draw 13 and a half metres of water that are the productive vessels for us to send down to Tasmania. Happy to send them down, but you don't have a port that will fit them. And so it's a simple dredge question. At the time, Tasports didn't have a dredging strategy. So just picking through the issues around what can we invest in um, 
we can we get productive market investment that's going to lower the cost, in your case, for the growers. Government spending patterns at the moment, wouldn't hold your breath for the inland rail, my personal view. That's the, um, the Commonwealth and the states and territories um, agreement budgeted for the next five years on highways and freeways and tollways. And also the smaller number you see underneath it is what's going on to the national standard gauge rail network. A large amount of that money is going into the Hunter Valley coal system and uh, some Sydney upgrades. So as you can see, we're very, very biased in our government spending at the moment towards highways. Highways in an economy of six, seven hundred billion tonne kilometres of freight, like Australia is, uh, th there's room for a productive mainline rail solution there. Um, but not if you're subsidising road freight and not if you keep putting more and more money into highways. Some ways you could, I guess, get serious about doing some of these things, you could, you could simply say, look, we'd like to market test um, someone to come and build a serious, heavy, uh, commercial uh, East Coast Railway, which would bring much cheaper freight to everyone up and down that line, west of the divide, across eastern Australia, uh, link in most of the containers that are in Australia, in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, there, are, there are rail builders, you don't have to go to China, there are very productive, large multi-billion dollar rail uh, operators five of them in the US, who, having dealt with them via Infrastructure Australia, I think it would be fair to say aren't going to take Australia seriously while we have a government-owned, uh, unfunded rail corporation um, and they don't see a really serious uh, intent to invest in, in significant freight infrastructure here. Um, open up those supply chains, as I said, across that matrix, try and work through how we can get productive super fund investment and other things into that road rail port supply chain. Um, and one very important thing, if you are going to stay with the model uh, where the government is simply going to fund everything and, and there aren't mechanisms for institutional investors to come in and fund agriculture, because a lot of people want to finance agriculture, they don't want to buy a farm, they want to finance the supply chains because they think agriculture in Australia is a good bet. They can't at the moment. So if we're going to stay with the government model, um, let's have some of those projects assessed for their price per tonne impact for freight. Because I can tell you now that from the green paper that was released, which talked about something around $50 billion worth of infrastructure projects for agriculture, none of them have been assessed on that basis. So your guess is as good as mine as to how efficient that investment of your money, or my money, uh, is going to be. Thank you.